1 to 2. And it says, you therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus and in the things that you have heard from me among many witnesses. Commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Amen. Amen. And that's the word of God. So it's my privilege, it's our privilege Amen. to invite our speaker for today, who is Dr. George Ogalo. He is the Global Chief Operating Officer for the International Fellowship of Evangelical Students. He is a career student ministry worker for over 20 years. He's the immediate former National Director of the Fellowship of Christian Unions, that is Focus Kenya, which is a member of the IFES. Apart from student ministry, he has been actively involved in church ministry over the years as a mission volunteer in the Anglican Church in the UK, an elder, a youth patron in Sitam Kisumu, head of department together with the wife in, min, in family ministry in Sitam Gong and preaching ministry among others. He holds a PhD in theology with a focus on biblical studies and a master of divinity in the biblical studies both from Africa International University. Prior to this, he had graduated with a Bachelor of Education from Egerton University. He's a leadership practitioner with experience in various boards, including Evangelical Alliance of Kenya, Kenya Christian Professionals Forum, Hesabika, and Nakada. George is married to Dr. Mary Thamari, and they have three children aged 18, 16, and 12. He is passionate about building the next generation for great impact for Christ in church and the society. So clap your hands together as we welcome Dr. George Ogalo. Allow me to, to pray for him. Our Lord and our Father, we thank you for this morning for the Family Discipleship Conference 2023. Lord, as we hear from your servant, Dr. George, we pray, O oh God, that you prepare our hearts, O oh Lord, and you make us not only be the hearers of your word, but also doers of it, O oh Lord. Bless him and speak to us through him in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning and praise the Lord. Uh, what a great joy to be here. I want to begin by appreciating um, the, the organizers uh, for the partnership in the ministry and the opportunity to come and minister. Uh, let me begin by acknowledging the presence of my family. My wife Mary is here. If you just stand and then there she is. Um, and then I came with part of my family. Um, my, my two boys and their cousin are sitting somewhere, uh, somewhere, somewhere over there, and there is one who is at school. Great. Uh, I am at that stage in life, and even age, where when I'm in a mixed congregation, and then the young people are asked to stand up. I don't know whether to stand up or not, because... If I, if, if, if I don't stand, the Wazes will be saying, Kujaona, you are not yet. But when the old people are asked to stand up and the young people are there and I'm still seated, they'll be saying, Mze Amuka, why are you still standing? So this morning, I am sharing about family, which has that spectrum. And I do hope that the Lord is going to connect with us at the points where we are. If you hear some of my examples that are neither young nor old, uh, bear with my stage. But I pray that in a special way the Lord is going to speak to us. Empowered to disciple. 
I am hoping that, oh great, thank you. Empower to Disciple is my topic, and I have a title there, Building a Gospel Generation, based on 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2, that we have read, and it's a best theme. And it is building a gospel generation through the family. And I'm going to share on about the purpose and goal of discipleship because it is important for us to think about discipleship, especially in the context of family, by raising the bar higher so that we are answering the question, why even be concerned about discipleship in the first place? And how does family discipleship then fit into that? But the second thing we'll talk about is the context of discipleship. And here we are going to be looking at the fact that discipleship must fit in a context. It must be relevant. We must not run the race blindly without considering where we are in the season. Thirdly, we will look at some model of family discipleship. I am sure that when we think about discipleship, a number of things come to our mind. But what does it exactly mean? How of discipleship, particularly for the family? And the fifth thing we will look at before we conclude is our expectations as we engage in discipleship and particularly family discipleship. There is a common narrative going on now. It is called the African moment. And it is a narrative that is alerting us to the fact that in terms of making disciples, in terms of church leadership, in terms of mission, it is an African moment. Some are taking too long to believe it, others are somewhere in the middle, and others are already saying it is the African moment for the church. And all the parameters point to the fact that there is a certain responsibility of mission, of leadership in the church that God is already giving to the African continent. The African moment of discipling nations. Paul would be so excited if he just resurrected today and just found us singing that song. Nitatangaza neno la kupwana kwa mataifa mbali mbali o. He would be so excited. But as we think about the responsibility that God has given us beyond our families, beyond our country, and to the rest of the world, we must remember that the family is a special place for disciple making. And the scriptures attest to this from the very beginning. The family is at the center of God's mission. So we find Abraham there with his family. Think about the family of Abraham. It includes Lot, the nephew. That's the beauty of an African family. So as you are seated here, or listening to me from wherever, and we think about family, please don't draw in your mind mother, father, and two or three perfect children. We are talking about an opportunity in the African context where family is not, the boundaries are not rigid. Today I have one of the cousins of my, 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 my children here. That is my son, right, in an African context. Family is a special place. Think about Moses. He's molding before his mission. Think about the mother. Think about Esther in collusion with somebody at the gate called Mordecai who was her relative. Think about family. If you read the book of Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 3 onwards, when God is speaking to the Israelites and he tells them something and you read for your on your own. So I have three assertions which is a debatable about discipleship in the family. Number one is that the best and the worst happens within the family. That can be a thesis. The best or the worst happens in the family. Go to the newspapers today. There is somebody who has probably lost their lives. A man has killed the wife. These days, we can't 
it's becoming commonplace. The worst can happen in the family, yet we know that the best can come out of a family. Number two, that family is the greatest mobilizing unit for the church membership and attendance. Oh, today I'm so privileged to have all my family members here except the one in school. You know, yesterday one of them, as we were talking, asking, will you go? He said, I'll think about it. But all the same, he is here. Which means that in terms of attendance tomorrow in this church, the family is the greatest mobilizing factor that constitutes the attendance of the church. So think about the future of the church. Think about the family. Number three, the church might provide Bible literacy, and indeed it does through Sunday school and so on, but the family is where all these matters are reviewed, they are acted on, and they are lived. So what do we mean when we talk about discipleship? How do we define it? Members of my family, when I asked this question a few days ago, had all options. But put together, biblical disciple making involves the whole process of winning the lost. Going to the nations and winning the lost. It includes building the believer. And that's what we see in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2. That Paul is building Timothy, whom he calls his son, to equip him as a worker, but also sending out proven multipliers as we see Paul telling him what you have heard me say in the presence of many and trust to reliable people who will also be able to teach others. From Matthew chapter 4 verse 18 to 19, Jesus called the disciples. What did he tell them? Come, follow me. So in my own crude way of thinking about discipleship, it is basically, discipleship means ensuring that our followership of Jesus Christ that we do makes sense and makes more sense, gospel sense. In fact, our calling to be followers of Jesus is in the spectrum of looking for goodies to the point of dying for him. Now, looking for goodies is the easiest thing. And as we will continue, we'll discover that for many of us, as we disciple our family members, our concerns can be at the level of discipling them for goodies because we want to disciple them so that they can have good careers, they can live a good life, and so on and so forth. But when you read the book of 2 Timothy that we read, actually, Paul is saying that from the prison where he is, the next thing for him is that he's going to be hung. Second Timothy is the last book that Paul wrote in the Bible, and he's writing it at the point where his death is imminent, and he's proud to die for the sake of the gospel. So the disciple spectrum we must have in mind is one that has the blessings of God, the goodies, but even much more the willingness to follow him even to the point of death. Just to continue with my introduction of what it is, discipleship has to be effective. When I was growing up, we had two sets of balls. Now, you can see on the screen there's one there we used to call, it's not exactly, I mean, I couldn't find that ball. It was smaller, it was called a BCD. I have no idea why it was called a BCD, but I suspect that there were those letters A, B, C, D. So we just used to say a B, C, D. If you grew up in the village those days, it was very special. Only very few people from the cities would come home to the villages with a BC, a BC, the bouncing ball, the small one. And then there was one that we had, we made ourselves called what? Ananga, I'm teaching you Greek, or Ajuala. Ananga, Nanga means cloth. So that one on the right actually used to have Nanga. Old clothes, you know, torn clothes, we used to convert it into what? A ball. And you see the substance, the, the out, a juala, juala is actually the polythene bag. And you see the way it's the one that's outside. So inside there, there are clothes, and then, uh, you know, and then there is that one. But you can also see that the material that Ananga is made of is very special. The strings there and so on. Now, as we think about discipleship that is effective, and I'm sorry that uh, that's a Manchester United ball, and uh, recently, for those who know, they know. Uh, 
It was so easy for the ABCD ball, once it gets into those sisal thorns, that's the end of the game. Sometimes we used to play out there and when the, when the, the animals went to graze off and ate you know, people's uh, you know, crops, one of, part of the punishment was some, for somebody just to come and, and get their, their, their BCD ball and cut it into pieces with a panga. And that's the end of this wonderful factory made a BCD. But for the Ananga one, my friend, it was enduring. It gets into th the thorns, you pick it, you keep on playing. Actually, even if it was cut into pieces, you still use the same raw materials to make another better Ananga. But you need to even look at the process of making an anga, the handmade one. Let me stop there because even to get that string that finally weaves it together, you need to go to the sisal plant, plant, you need to get the leaves of the sisal, the sisal, you need to do something to get the right things and weave that string a long journey. This apple ship is not factory made. It's not a shortcut. And the product should be enduring. Quality is in performing the function. Yes, both balls uh, perform this, the function, but there is staying power. And as Paul writes to Timothy, you can see he's thinking about staying power too. It has to be dynamic and innovative, and that's why we'll be talking about the issue of relevance, context. Ananga can reinvent himself and live again. How does effective discipleship look like? Fulfilling the function and withstanding the times. So allow me to go to the text a bit, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2. And the things you, Timothy, have heard me, me, Paul, say in the presence of many witnesses and trust or commit to reliable, faithful people who will also be qualified to teach others. It's wonderful to see Paul seeing the next generation from his prison cells. And he sees the next generation, one generation at a time. In fact, he also sees one person at a time. Can you imagine Paul, Paul focusing on Timothy and saying, you, Timothy, will be the trigger of passing the gospel across generations. That it is from Paul to Timothy, but it can be spread to many more. Paul to Timothy, reliable others, and others. When I think about my family, when you think about your family, do you think about it in the example of Abraham as a nation? Who is it that is in your family? What possibilities are there? The emphasis of Paul here is on passing it on. Pass it on. Pass it on. It is not about the ministry of, of teaching. It's not about the ministry of teaching emphasized in that verse where it says those who are qualified to teach others because I know for sure that for you as a parent, in the family context, you are telling yourself, I don't have the gift of teaching. By the way, some people don't have the gift of teaching. Some people even do the course education, but then when they just stand in the presence of two or three more people, just something just happens. So certainly, not all parents are teachers in this sense. So this is not promoting the gift of teaching as the only way of passing it on. And in the context of parenting, as we read these scriptures, no guilt. Because as we look forward to then, as we continue, we'll realize that this is not emphasizing the ministry of teaching. This for Paul and Timothy was important for their function that they were having in church. But this is not the qualification for you to effectively disciple your family. So do not begin to feel like, I don't have what it takes. I don't have the gift of teaching. No, there is a place for you. Passing it on might mean many things. Orally, because Paul says, you heard me say. Written, Paul has written just a book, to, uh, something to, to Timothy. And this one was to be shared in the churches. Lifestyle. And there are many more opportunities. You know what? The book of Timothy, actually, is not typical to talk about family discipleship. It's not typical. It's not the obvious book to talk about it. No. When Paul, Paul himself, does he have a wife? It is alleged that Paul does not have a family. So really, what are we talking about? How about Timothy? Does he even have a girlfriend? We don't know. 
Oh, wait a minute. Who is Paul talking about in 2 Timothy chapter, the whole of 2 Timothy? Then the father of Timothy is nowhere. The people who are mentioned are Eunice, your mother, and Lois, your grand, grandmother. So honestly, there is no perfect family in the book of Timothy. So it sounds like the imperfect one, but praise be to God. As we are seated here, we all know that our families are not perfect. And God is calling us in the imperfect families, single parent families, whatever it is that is the design of your family, God is still telling us we can pass it on. We can pass it on. Family discipleship. The book is not typical to family discipleship. But when you think about family discipleship, discipleship is about relationships. And I can quote many texts there where Paul refers to his ancestors in chapter 1, verse 3. You can go and read that. I'm assuming some biblical literacy here uh, when Paul refers to his ancestors. Paul acknowledges the grandma and mom of Tim as a foundation to his sincere faith. He talks, says, I'm reminded of your sincere faith which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice and I am persuaded now lives in you only. In chapter 3, verse 14 to 15, he says, but as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of because you know those from whom you learned it and how from your infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. So it's about relationships. It is about relationships. And the family offers a great context for that. The book of Timothy is personal. And it's possible between Paul and Timothy. Apart from being relational, of course, it's important for us to know that verse 1 talks about being strong in the grace of God. But secondly, family to family relationships is part of the ministry. As I have said, there are no boundaries in Af an African families. They are more, more flexible. And so today, I have one of my family members from my father's, my, 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 my brother's family. So when you think about family, don't think about your own family. Think about the one who lives with you. The, 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 you, the cousin of your cousin of your cousin. Hallelujah. That is family. And God has blessed us that in Africa, we don't say there is no room in the inn. There is always room in the inn. There's always an extra something on the plate. I mean, the opportunity is there. You know, if you want to take a visa today to, to, to go to the UK, they will want to be convinced that the house you are visiting has enough rooms to cater for those that are visiting. That is part of the requirement. If it's not enough, then there is no going there. Timothy must have told the stories of his parents, the influence of mom, the influence of Lois. Where did Paul know about this thing? Timothy must be appreciating and saying, by the way, by the way, and do you know, for family discipleship, you never know what you plant today. You might not even know that somebody is listening to you. Hello? Do you know when children are doing some things on the side, you think that they are not listening at all, my friend? Their way of listening is just so special. And they don't give you feedback now. But one day when you are not there, when Lois is not there, when Eunice is not there, Timothy will be saying, by the way, by the way. And sometimes it was so fickle for you that you didn't think you were saying anything. Family discipleship. The family is the most conducive environment within which discipleship can happen. For families headed by believers, the church complements the discipleship making through the family and not vice versa. Now, this is, can be controversial. Pastors, forgive me. I am saying that there is more church in, at home than at church. Do you know how many times we pray at home? Maybe in the morning. But certainly when there is food over lunchtime, there is prayer. Certainly when there is a meal at dinner, there is prayer. Certainly before you go to sleep, there is prayer. So one day, church happens at home many times. And the church at church is in partnership. 
I think it is important for us to recognize this. The problem we have, especially in a religious Kenya, is that when we do those things, we don't even recognize that opportunity. Anytime you pray, what is your prayer like? It's always interesting for me to hear my children using the very words I use for prayer. The very words the mother uses for prayer. Sometimes, I don't know whether they have gone to the dictionary to check, but how you pray, the scope of your prayer. You cannot be praying for this food and you are not remembering that there are some people who are so hungry and some animals that are dying there and you are just praying. What does that mean? We are on a discipleship anytime we are on the table. So I find the family an, a, a wonderful place for, for, for making disciples. Church happens in the family more than any other space. Every meal time is church happening. Now, I find the family an excellent place to practice marketplace Christian faith. And let me tell you why. When you are a Christian and you are a CEO, you wonder, how do I live my Christian faith in the context of my workplace? And you think, I'm the one who is going to sign these letters to sack somebody. Because CEOs sometimes have to do that. But at the same time, you want to express the love of Christ. So you are in a dilemma. You are the head teacher of a school. You are supposed to do the punishment, dis discipline. At the same time, you are supposed to say, tell the students, praise be to God. So sometimes you are in a dilemma. What do we do? And that's exactly what I find in the family. In the family, I am meant to discipline. And I'm also supposed to talk about the love of Jesus. Sometimes you have just been angered or you have felt something not right. At the same time, you're supposed to read John chapter 3, verse 16. You, it is the place to, to contend. How does this faith work? And if we practice that in the family, our mission in the marketplace will follow us a similar pattern. So I find the family, the place where life is lived in reality, is the place where there is discipline, is the place where the father fails and there is vulnerability, it is the place where there are conflicts that children can also be able to see, but it is also the place now to say, so what does this mean for us as Christians? It's the place where there is forgiveness. So, Paul says, you, however, know all about my teaching, my way of life, my purpose, my faith, patience, love, endurance, even persecution and suffering. So Paul calling Timothy, my son, even because of that proximity to each other, he is aware that Paul had gone through issues that he was able to observe. And family offers an opportunity to, to have it real and to be authentic. Let me go to the purpose of discipleship. The purpose of discipleship, uh, Paul says in Timothy chapter uh, 2, uh, verse four to se verse four, ch chapter 4, verse 7 to 8, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith, now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me on that day, and not only to me, but also to those who have longed for his happening, for his appearing. Now, my brothers and sisters, we have just said that for many of us, as we think about family discipleship, we are thinking about parameters of success, and I'm thinking that we are saying, let's disciple these, these children so that they can be able to survive, so that they can be able to succeed. But remember that fruitfulness, a fruitful lifestyle, is actually the bottom line when it comes to why we are involved in discipleship. We need to be light and salt in the society. But we also must remember that when we disciple each other in the context of family, it is fulfilling the mandate so that each one of us can be able to go and multiply, to go wherever it is that God is leading us so that we can share the good news. But also that at the end of the day, because for Paul, as he writes, he can see the end of the day. He can see the end of the day, the day in this life. And he is saying there's another place where he is going to reign with Christ. And it's always a joy when loved ones pass on, on the burial day, you know you are not saying kwaheri. You are saying kwaheri ya kona, konana. You are not saying goodbye. You are saying good night. It's always a joy. 
that as family, one time we will again meet at the feet of Jesus. The goal of discipleship must go beyond feeling good, goodies, good careers, and all those success parameters. God has called us to a life of fruitfulness, to be light and salt wherever we are, to, to fulfill the mandate to share the gospel, and indeed one day share the new kingdom. I want to ask us as we think about our discipleship in the family, do we have this in mind? Do you think about the nations? Do you know that that child is a nation to the nations? Do you perceive it? Do you know that that, that child has life beyond materialism and consumerism? Do you know that there is, what, what, is, what, are, we, what are we thinking about? What's our goal in discipleship? So as we do all the things we do in family discipleship, let's bear this in mind. The context of discipleship. Our discipleship must be relevant. If we go to the next slide. Because we are living in a broken world. We are living in a broken world. We cannot close our eyes. You know, Paul writes to Timothy, and he acknowledges that Timothy has pressure both from inside and outside. As a young person, his emotions are raging, there are youthful desires, but also that Timothy is facing a lot of pressure from outside. Paul himself has indicated that he has faced a lot of pressure. Timothy at this point has been, is in charge of churches including Ephesus and things are not easy at all at Ephesus. At this point, it is important for us to remember if you call yourself a disciple as a parent or whoever you are, an auntie in the family context, remember that a disciple is also a disciple of Jesus Christ. Empowering Timothy also acknowledges that Timothy himself is facing pressures internal and external. And he is in a journey. The teacher is also the follower. And this is beautiful in a family context because the father knows that he is struggling. But we have to disciple each other through the journey. The parent is a child in family discipleship context. He is learning. He's listening. I can't tell you how much I really benefit from my children through the questions they ask, the challenge they offer to me, so that I may mirror myself in the light of God's word. Paul himself talks as if he has learned and benefited so much from Timothy. He's so beautiful. He says, I remember where you've got it from, but I know that you have a sincere faith. When, when you are, you are relative, you are child, you are household, is living an authentic life of faith, it speaks to your heart. So family discipleship is not one way. And that's why parents should never undermine how God uses their little children to speak life into them. And we must have that ability to listen. But we are talking about context. Today, as we have seen, Paul understands the context in which he's writing to Timothy. And he's saying, Timothy, there is persecution, there is suffering, there is moral decay, but there is even loneliness because in that whole passage he says, you know, so and so, everybody has deserted me. And he names names, he names names people who have deserted him in the ministry. As we disciple each other, even in the family context, let us remember that our context has pressures. The pressures of corruption, that's the talk of the day. These days, by the way, we just talk of, about billions, right? Millions vanished when it comes to corruption. And we find the newspaper playing with us, Mara, this was released, the other one is countering and saying it was released this way and that way. And there are billions, right? Billions, it's a game. And this is a real issue. And I can tell you, for honest Christians in Kenya, one of the greatest persecutions we face is corruption. Because you turn right, you turn left, it's a big deal. My children know the stories of how 
my wife and I interact with corruption. When the police stop me, and they have stopped me a few times when I, am, I have overspeeded by 10 kilometers per hour, innocently, they know I have, have engaged with the police. And if, then if they are not there, when we come to the dinner table, I have always, we have always shared how to navigate it in a godly way. Because corruption has become part of our society. We think about consumerism and materialism, which is catching up with us. You, you even go to the supermarket and you don't have money, but you want to consume with your eyes. It is called window shopping. Eh? You just want to go to the new, you know, where the, the newest brands are. You consume even when you don't have money with your eyes. For three hours, we are just consuming without money. Poverty is real, is real in our context. It's biting. Joblessness. How do we talk about it in our discipleship context? Liberalism in many forms. Right now, the LGBTQ is a big deal. And I think as, as disciples, we need to put this on the table. We need to be discussing what does this mean? I'm sure that many of us parents are, are so afraid about how the future looks like. We must put that future on the table here. Celebrity culture, tech culture, is our discipleship relevant? We have a crisis of credibility in our society, characterized by lack of integrity. But even within the church, we have to disciple our, our children and our loved ones around the church because there's a credibility crisis there. There's so much happening, worldliness that is influencing the church. And we must, we must do that if we are going to create hope for the society, hope for the society, but also hope for the Christian because our children must learn that we are in a context of persecution of forms, that, that, that the Christian today is detached, is isolated, is disengaged, is perceived to be relevant, and is full of apathy. And in fact, this experience is in our schools and workplaces, despite the fact that we are saying that we are 80% Christian. These are realities that we have. Very quickly, uh, because I see my time is moving fast, how, how do we go about discipleship? I have borrowed some model from a church called Village Church uh, and adjusted it a bit. Th that there are ties, we must, we must, we must, discipleship has been characterized by spending time in prayer, reading the word of God and practicing faith. Of course, because it has to be intentional and we man, must plan for it and that's why we have family altars. And you can read Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 3 and verse 9 and see how that picture is painted. One of the joys in our house is when our children ask in the night, have we prayed? You know, that's really encouraging. Have we prayed? It's not the parents asking. Have we prayed? That's an important tradition that they have internalized and they believe is important. It's wonderful to be systematic, even cover the Bible book to book. I have never done it. I've never covered the Bible book to book from A to Z. I have failed. I confess in public. Maybe I've read the whole Bible, but to start from Genesis to Revelation, in an isumbua sana. Because when I reach somewhere, I am thinking, thinking, I even stop reading further. So what I know is that I read books, a book like the whole of 2 Timothy, I've read the whole of it. I couldn't have read only two scriptures because I want to get the context. But A to Z, the only person in my family who has attempted is the 12 years old. He has reached, read from Genesis, he reached Hosea. And we didn't tell him to read that. We don't know from where he got it. So we have to stop him at some point at 11 p.m. and saying, hey, man, you need to go to bed. And we, we only ask, so where are you? What are you learning? The other time when he was in Songs of Solomon, I asked, so what did you get there? And he said, it doesn't make sense. And I think he was right. He was right. Does it make sense? But do you know what? That sense will come out later when he, he remembers. He may not quote me the way Lois and Eunice are quoted, but he will say, there's something attached. My mother, I've quoted my mother um, my mother's name appears in my dissertation, PhD dissertation paper, because I know she prays. I know she prays. So my brother, my sister, dear parent, don't worry. It will be somewhere. It will be somewhere. And you don't know what it is. 
family time, that altar, being able to read God's word and pray together. However, we need to be aware of monotony because sometimes we bring the school curriculum into the family. We want to complete the syllabus. And it is problematic. We want, you know, we come from a for, for, you know, school and formality. We want to cover from cover to cover. So we put discipleship like we are on a guilt trip. That's not God's calling for us. I know the only time that we really made progress together as a family was during COVID. COVID ensured that we were going nowhere. So I know that we read the book of John together. We read Proverbs. We read, um, they need to tell me. Uh, there, there were more, including Revelation, cover to cover. And it didn't seem to be stressful. It was actually fun. But we didn't say we must do this for every book. We are not in competition because we must ensure that our discipleship is not about finishing the curriculum. So it needs to lead us to what we call moments. Moments. I wish I had more time to talk about moments. Spontaneous moments. Moments where you're in the car and somebody is asking you the question like one of them was asking me these human rights questions. You know that the human rights questions is when somebody begins to say, is it fair? You know? Is it fair? that uh, the, the Muslims, you know, should be judged while they were born in those families? Very difficult question. You almost want to park by the side of the road and, and think about it. But you know, spontaneous moments of discipleship. Today as we were coming, one of my sons asked the other, seeing a nice car somewhere at the traffic lights, he says, between that Jeep and our car, which one do you prefer? And the one inside said, I prefer that Jeep outside. So I just made a comment and said, by the way, do you think if we were in this Jeep, we would have reached the church faster? <laughs> and the answer is obvious. So it is really moments of passing on values. There are many, many. One example is just the dinner table, dinner table. We asked the other day, asking our children about this family discipleship. In fact, I think the dinner table is the fun place. It is a fun place. There's something around food, my brothers and sisters. Don't take food lightly. When people eat, they open up, and so on and so forth. There is joy after that, and a lot of discipleship happens. So if you are here and you are not a teacher of the word, you are not ordained, just know there are many moments for us. Milestones to celebrate. Birthdays. You know, there are many. Signposts, people turning 12, and you remind them that Jesus Christ at 12 was in the synagogue, okay? <laughs> Preaching. Transitions from school or college. You, 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 it is God-centering moment. Gospel moments are really not opening the scriptures all the time. They are, they are those, those golden moments. And I can see Timothy remembering where those moments were with the mother. I don't think that they talked about the scriptures only when they were seated, as they were going along the way. But also, create space. And that's a modification I've done to that model. Freedom. Freedom. God speaks. God is speaking even when you think he's not speaking. Another time I went to the resurrection garden for prayers. It's not happened only once, and I go with my, my two of my children, and you know at the Resurrection Gardens, it's a Catholic place, you need to be quiet. But the scriptures are all over. You will like the place. The scriptures are all over. So we are just walking each person on their own, and every person can decide what they do, only that we have to keep together. And I know they are reading the scriptures. We go into this Catholic place and there is silence. And I'm just wondering, so what is that uh, eight-year-old thinking as he's seated there quietly? But you know, I believe God is doing his own thing. So when we go back home, I don't tell them to tell me all the scriptures that were there. I just ask, how was it? And then you can hear somebody saying, it was really good. I don't have to ask, how really good? No, I know God is at work in the life of that person. So create space for God to speak to his people. Another time my son came from school, the one who is not here, and I had gone to his bedroom to be able to, to, to ask him to come out for something. And when I went there, he was still in uniform, and I found him praying, okay? I just closed the door, and I just don't know what is God doing in this life. 
So my brothers and sisters, in the family context of discipleship, let God be He's working in the lives of those people. In terms of expectations, and I've said this, what do then do we expect out of family discipleship? I have said this before, that the desire for family members is so that our children may turn well. What are our parameters for success for our children or our relatives in the context of family? What is Paul rejoicing about? Why did Timothy's mom commit to read or expose him to the scriptures? Paul's call to Timothy is a call to holiness, a call to courage. Don't we need that now? A call to confidence in God's word and to stand up for Christ. Family may be a place to fan into flame the gift of God in a child and other members, but it sounds to me like Lois and Eunice didn't even know the direction that Timothy would take later. They did not prescribe to Timothy his future career. This was the space for them to watch and see the unfolding of God, God's will in the life of Timothy. So is your epitome of success for your discipleship, could it be described with these words that she is godly? Is that enough? He was godly. My dad was godly. Is that enough? As I go to my con the conclusion, the question is, what is the disciple that we want? The disciple we want. The disciple we want is going to be a disciple that is a product of partnerships. I know it can look like they are all pieces and we want the product, that elephant. But it is one day at a time. The puzzle comes together and God knows how it comes together. Puzzles is one of the things that uh, has been played in my family. I'm not a fan of puzzles. In fact, I watch from a distance. But my wife and the children, they are called to puzzles. And they have sometimes done magic around it. Sometimes you don't see whether it's the leg or it is the tail that has been formed. But let's leave that to God. Because whatever little piece we, we put there contributes towards the whole. And it's a partnership. The family with the body of Christ and many more people. So, in summary and conclusion, we need to be empowered disciples. Whether you are a grandma, a child, a father, whichever formation you have in the context of family, we need to pass on good news as our priority. Good news. Good news. That's the priority of Paul. He's he is in for it. He is dying for it. Good news. And this good news is not good news that is private. It is good news that when it lands in the office, when it lands in the school, wherever it, it goes, it creates transformation. Relevant, understanding what issues we need for redemption. Thirdly, to be intentional to be discerning, and to be modeling discipleship. And lastly, to appreciate that it's the work of the Holy Spirit and we need to sit, relax, and watch God at work. Let me give an illustration as a way of conclusion of a story in the Bible of, in Luke chapter 15, verse 11 to 32. Do you remember the nameless man whose son is called the prodigal son? He is nameless and the wife is not even mentioned. This man, his family are considered to be a perfect family because they lack nothing. Oh yes, they lack nothing. He has enough money to be able to, well, to distribute. He has servants, he has servants. That family must be very well sheltered. I, there could be a dog, Umbuakali at the gate. That's a, a, a family that lacks nothing. The father is good, they are named father. Because, how do we know? He is loving, right? He's forgiving and he's generous. But it's just that the boy, who is also innocent, is not ready to handle wealth, right? So he's given and he goes out and you know what happens. Then it comes with all these pains. Do you know what? This father, in this family, he wished that the son grew in his own image and wishes. That script 
he's not perfect. And you see what happens. The same father, one goes away, one stands. Today, I know parents who are in agony. And I know some of us are in agony because you have done your best. Then there is one that says, give me my wealth, and they go. And there is pain on one side. And then there is this other one. And you wonder, how come we did all we did and our children are filing for divorce? How come my son <clears throat> that I read so well is into drugs big time? And I know it can be difficult. But let me encourage you. When you have put the puzzles together, let the Lord have his way. I remember the story of T.D. Jakes, which is shared in public when her daughter, who was 14, became pregnant. That was such a moment. How do you manage your image? What happens? And I'm sure that many of us here, we could be feeling a sense of failure. We could be feeling that we don't have the right gifts. Where does this find you? But I want to encourage you today that the family is the best place. And there is little investment that you are doing there that is building nations. But there is God at work. And let God be in your family. God bless you. Our Lord and our God, we, we thank you. <clears throat> we thank you for your grace because even, <clears throat> even though Paul is talking to Timothy who may feel accomplished, he is telling him to be strong in the grace of the Lord. And it can only be grace. Lord, when we look at the scriptures, we see the family, the first family, Adam and Eve, their first children, their first children, we see what happens. The pain of Adam and Eve, losing one child in the hands of the other, and the remaining one being sent away in the wilderness, and we see this imperfection in the family with Abraham, with David, and it goes on and on. So Lord, we are in the company of these heroes of faith today, acknowledging our weaknesses in our families as parents, as children. And we pray that you may help us to know that it's only you who is perfect and that there is grace. There is grace to forgive. There is grace for us to deal with our guilt. And there is hope. And that there is a lot you are doing through our lives that we have not seen yet. So we pray that today you will set us free so that we can look up to you. Lord, if there are areas where we need forgiveness, where we need strengthening, we embrace those but we pray that you may help us to rise again and fulfill our mandate in small ways for the kingdom gospel. So we thank you and bless you and pray for your grace and your spirit upon each one of us so that we may stay faithful to, for the next generation. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you.